Welcome to People Love Process. In this movie, I want to take you through the seven stages of development I use when creating brand identity and iconography. The principles of ideation, building, and attention to detail are the same whether you're creating a brand mark or an iconic design. We have a lot to cover, so let's get started. At Glitchka Studios, we do a lot of logo and icon design. So this is a good assortment of a lot of the various brands and companies we've worked with over the years. The oldest one here goes about, I'd say, eight years back or so. But uh, we specialize in what I call illustrative design. I'm going to be touching on that in just a little bit to explain what I mean by that. But we're going to jump into uh, the first section here. And the first section is design foundation. This is thinking made visual. This is everything about the creative process that you don't need software for. But I want to cover it because if you don't do this well, your design's not going to work well. So it's really important to get this right. And it comes down to having a systematic process. How do you think through a project? So when you're trying to come up with those insightful ideas, you have to lay a good foundation. That foundation comes from research. Now, you can do this in a lot of different ways. You can use a creative brief. I use that for clients. Uh, usually, if I'm working with an agency, they provide it to me. But anyway, it gives me that information to draw from, to glean from, uh, to make those kind of metaphoric associations that lead to a really clever mark. So it's about understanding and making those associations through research strategy. Strategy is all about knowing who the target audience is, whether it's a product, a service, or a brand a, a company. It's like you have to know who they're trying to reach and what aesthetic or style is going to be appropriate for that. So those are some of the things you have to keep up front and log into that chamber before you actually start creating, even before you start drawing. Drawing comes after you've loaded all that information into your chamber and you've let your mind do what it does best. It makes patterns. It makes associations. And this is where you, once those start forming is when you want to start drawing and working out your ideation. And that might take two or three days of just whenever something comes to mind, you're either writing something down or you're sketching it out in a simple little thumbnail sketch. It doesn't have to be perfect. And then once you have those ideas and you're able to isolate directions that you could move forward with, that's where craftsmanship comes in. This is where you go into Illustrator and you start crafting uh, your brand marks or iconography. So this is the process I use, the systematic process, if you will, on every project we work on. So I think Saul Bass said it well. He's the quintessential illustrative designer. And he said, design is thinking made visual. I totally agree with that. Sloppy thinking leads to sloppy ideas. So uh, it's really important to do the mental work up front. Unfortunately, they don't really teach this in design school. And I think there should be a concept in class where it's not so much about craftsmanship and the final design, it's about how to think about it, how to process it, and come up with those ideas. I think that would really help the industry as a whole. Let's jump into the second category, and this is brand marks and icons. This is brand identity design proper. Uh, so what do I mean by that? Well, let's take a look at logos and icons. If you look at these uh, six designs, which ones are logos and which ones are icons? I know because I created them, but do you know just by looking at it? Well, you might not always know that. If you look at this owl and this lion and this mark up here, which is very simple and geometric of a rocket of sorts, uh, those are three logos. The other three are icons, different clients, different genres, different styles. This one's a typeface and we use the negative space. It was for a food service company. This was for an analytics company. So it's all about research analytics, this specific icon theme. And this one was for a role-playing game. So an icon used on the back of one of the cards used in the game. So a lot of different industries will utilize the same aesthetic because all of these in essence, are graphic and iconic. Some are a little more illustrative than others, like the lion and the owl. And that's what I want to touch on next, 
illustrative design. What is what is that? Well, if you look at two of the most popular brands in the United States, you have the Target logo on the left. If you go to the Lips tool here, you could probably build this logo in about 45 seconds using a Lips tool. But Target is a million dollar, multi-million dollar company uh, with retail outlets all around the country. And this is their brand mark. This would be a good representation in the category of brand identity as pure blood graphic design. It's all geometric in shape and form. If you look at the Starbucks logo on the right, theirs is the Green Mermaid. And it's more illustrative because at some point in the creative process, drawing was used to refine it and figure out what to do. And then they built it in vector form. So that's the difference between graphic design and illustrative design. And we specialize in a lot of illustrative design. That said, it's super fun to come up with a nice, clean geometric mark as well when uh, the client needs it. So if we take a look at this design and I asked you, what is this? Is this a logo or is it an icon? Well, in reality, it's both. And what I mean by both is yes, it works for in this exploration. This is for an executive assistant company called Kangaroo Star. It works as the brand mark for their logo identity with the logo type that goes with it. This is a vertical, this is a horizontal. We usually show it on um, a colored or dark background so it shows them how they could use it in that context. But it also would work. They had a plans to do an app. So we also mocked up how the app icon could work as well. So in this case, it works for both. And that's where logos and icons have a lot of compatibilities with each other. And that's why you see a lot of logos on app icons because they have the same principles used when you're designing both. And we're going to go over a lot of that here. So for this project, we do a lot of exploration. The first round was the top row. These were the four we showed. The agency that hired us to do it for their client, which was Kangaroo Stars, loved it showed it to the client, client didn't like any of them, asked for another round uh, showing different styles and approaches. And that's what we did here. They didn't like that either. And then the owner of the company said, could you do something more abstract? And I had to ask him, well, what do you mean by abstract? Well, you know, kind of like Picasso of sorts. And I, okay, so we did these. I've never done logos that look like that. They're kind of cool, a little weird, but whatever. Didn't like those either. <laughs> He said, but I like the colors. I'm going, okay, well, that's a little positive, but could you make them look like Baja style? And if you're not familiar with that, just look it up, Google it. And we did that. We did all these icons or logo marks, that is, of a kangaroo and a Baja style. Guess what? Didn't like those either. He ended up going back to this one. And they ended up changing the color, though, to the gray and is kind of bad. And ultimately, the agency who hired us kind of said bye-bye to the client. And I was glad to have that project done. A little frustrating. Let's jump into the third um, part here. And this is build methods. This is where we're going to get into the nitty-gritty of craftsmanship. And one way you can do it is creating with strokes. You don't always have to build with shapes or with the pen tool. Uh, to make elegant curves, you can just use simple strokes. And so I'm going to walk you through that. It always helps to look at reference. It doesn't matter if it's realistic, graphic, or stylized. Look at reference to draw out what makes a toucan, in this case, uh, look like a toucan or a tropical bird, whatever the species is. So I looked at this, and then I drew this simplified, knowing that the style I was going to do uh, could all be based and uh, created using strokes. So if I usually select my, uh, my drawing like this. And by the way, a lot of people have asked, how do you get your drawing into the computer? I use a flatbed scanner. It's the best way to do it. I usually scan in 600 to 800, go to transparency, and I usually adjust my transparency to about 15%, lock the layer. Yes, you could dim the layer with layer controls, but it's an extra step. I don't see... I, I never use that, but if you want to, that's fine. Turn on this layer, and these are all simple paths. These are all, once you figure out your drawing, it becomes a roadmap for vector building. You don't have to think. 
Not that you won't make changes. I realized as I was building this that this line didn't look good once I had a perfect circle in here. So I brought it to the top of the circle and snapped it to this anchor. By the way, I have Smart Guides turned on, Command U to toggle it on and off. And it really helps building. Sometimes you'll want to toggle it off because it tries to snap when you don't want it to. Uh, but on his beak, I had it come down to this corner and my sketch, it looked fine. But when I came to build, I realized, ah, that looks better if it terminates right at the like apex of the curve. So those are the things you'll make decisions on. Now I'm going to show you, I'm not going to show you a lot of plugins in this movie, but I'm going to show you one plugin and it's a, it's a cool one. It's by Astute Graphics. It's called Subscribe and we're going to go to, it's called Arch by Points. And the reason why I like it is these were all made simply with uh, the pen tool here, but we're going to make a, a line using this one's called, once again, Arch by Points Tool. With that selected, I'm going to go down here, and you're going to click once down here. So we'll click once, and that will establish that point. I'll go all the way over to where the end point is on this leaf right here, and I'll click. And then it allows you to make any curve you want between those two anchor points. And I'm going to come up here, and on the bottom edge curve, of the toucan, I'm going to find the anchor point. I'm going to snap it to it. This is why I use smart guides to do this type of work. And look, it does all the geometry for me. It's a lot easier than taking the pin tool and doing this and then going to the anchor point tool and then bending it. It's never going to be perfect. You'd have to adjust it with these handles like this and you'd still have to play around with it. Is it possible? Sure it is but it'll just take longer. That's why I use plugins. Once I get all my line work like this, I'll just select it all. And in this case, I'll just go to strokes and we're gonna beef this up because I want this to be somewhat of a weighty uh, type look like that. And I think that looks good. Maybe you might prefer it to have rounded edges. So instead of coming to a point on the leaves, it would kind of soften it by rounding those off, whichever way you prefer. That's fine. This is where I'll go to the colors. I'm thinking in this case, green, and we'll drag it like that. And you can see how easy you can create a mark like this. Now, ultimately, I think I want to keep these, um, these pointed now that I'm looking at this on the leaf. So I'm going to take these and I'm going to remove the rounds so they come to a point. Once I expand this from a path, I'll go in and add subtle rounds on that because I do want it to be a little sharp, but not dagger sharp like vector usually is. So let's go to layers. and I'll show you how I locked it up with type. So on a design like this, I'll find a type that I think is compatible with the genre, the target audience, and the style I'm using. And we'll talk about customizing type a little more coming up. But this is a great style that also works on a light background, but it'll work on a colored background. That's not always true with every mark. As soon as you reverse it to white, what reads as dark might read as light, and it'll make it look weird. But this is a style that's very forgiving. So you can see how it works really great on a dark, colored, or photographic background like this. Let's take a look at another one, and this one's an icon design. So once again, this was just a thumbnail sketch that I drew and I looked at reference of golf because I don't golf. Um, it just angers me whenever I play golf, so I don't enjoy it. Uh, but I look at how they swing and then I just drew a little one continuous line based off of, of that drawing and I just build it with simple uh, paths. And this is where I will use the pen tool and I'll use some shapes to create like his feet so they're perfect circles. Then this is where you can go in and use the corner widget in Illustrator to highlight a corner like these two corners and then maybe we're gonna round it so it looks more like a club there. I think that looks uh, a lot better like that. So it's not hard to do this kind of, uh, uh, kind of building to create the final art here. Now this stroke, I want this stroke a certain size. We're going to go here and we're going to beef this up to nine. Hit it like that. And I don't want the ends to terminate flat. So I'm going to add a round cap to that. And on this one, we're going to go ahead and color it this gray. This is kind of the branded gray we ended up using on this project. And if I turn on what the final art looks like, we had a nice little color splash that goes behind each of these icons. We did these for Canada Life Insurance Company in Canada. 
And we did over 100 icons, and these were some of my favorite ones from that set. My ultimate favorite is probably the golfer. I, I just like the pose, how that came out. Here's another way you can use strokes. So we were hired to create a bunch of brand explorations for Oklahoma Baptist, and uh, they wanted a lot of different ideas. And so this just shows you how you can use strokes again, but this is in pieces. Don't try to build it all in one stroke. So all of these are just pieces of strokes. I just composite them together because I can select all of these and it's a lot easier to build that way and make it more manageable and flexible. In this case, we're just gonna uh, go ahead and punch in six here to get that weight and we'll color it from the magenta to this kind of golden color. And you can see you get the exact art over here. Now I've expanded it and just fused all the shapes together because right now they're still separate if I select that over here. And if you don't know how to expand, it's super easy. Just uh, select everything, go to object, path, uh, and outline stroke. And then you can unite it with the pathfinder. You can also find these, uh, uh, these abilities to expand in the properties panel. But notice down here, we have that corner. So that would be an example where I would just zoom in like this, select that corner and just round it until it disappears into the other shapes like that. So those are the attentions, the detail you have to pay attention to when you're working with strokes, but not hard. Anybody can use this to build a brand mark like this. Let's jump into the third category of build methods. Uh, uh, the next category in, in number three is geometric shape building. Now this is easy because you can build perfectly in Illustrator geometric shapes. So you could do a thumbnail sketch to capture the essence of an idea. And on this, I'd use the same principle of just adjusting the opacity, locking the layer, and starting to build on top of it with simple shapes. Well, I have these two rectangular shapes, and if I go ahead and just color these with the fill here, and we go to the Pathfinder, let's drag that out so we can see it, and we unite it. So now we have a giant plus, and it's sitting on top of our other elements. I'm gonna clone this to make a copy, Command-C, Command-F. Just made a copy of that shape. I'll select this, and I'll minus front. I'll select the next copy we made and I'll minus front, and that cuts through all those. Then I can take these and just ungroup them. That way they're separate shapes. Select these and go ahead and unite them like that to fuse my little target marks or whatever you want to call them, the rectangle or the triangles to these curves. And you have a shape like this. And then of course, we can go over, we can color this however we want. Now, ultimately, uh, in the final output, this is the colors we used uh, to accomplish here. So that's how you can focus on, you don't have to always draw everything perfect, especially if it's geometric. Illustrator allows you to create precisely with geometric shapes using the ellipse tool, the square tool, you know, the hexagon tool, the star tool. So uh, just think in shapes, draw it simplified to capture the essence and then build it precisely in Illustrator using those shaping tools. Let's look at the next way. The next way is combining shapes. So you can use a combination of shapes uh, to bring them together to uh, figure out the, the final composition. So this was a logo direction. The client wanted a Capricorn type theme since he was a Capricorn. So again, I take the sketch of the general idea I have in mind, set the opacity, lock the layer, but the shapes I originally build on top, it's easier to focus on certain things alone. So I focused on the ram horn first because I knew that would be the trickiest. And you can see it doesn't even match my drawing exactly. That's because I finagled with this a lot. All you have to keep in mind on a shape like this is, by the way, I never use uh, the uh, whatever tool it's called. I don't even remember where it is. It's somewhere in the toolbox, but it does these spirals. Those never help me at all. I just avoid that and build it by scratch. If you think like a clock, you have a 12 o'clock position, nine o'clock, six o'clock, three o'clock, and then where it comes to a point, gets a point. Those are the easy ones to discern. 
back to six, nine, 12. If you think in a clock, I call it the clockwork method, um, you can figure out a shape like this. So that's what I built first was this, built the head, but notice I thought the divot didn't look good. I want this to just visually go straight into this curve here. And then we have the bottom, uh, we have uh, the goatee on a goat, get it? Uh. <laughs> All these shapes are separate and it's easier to build this way because we can just select everything. We can go to the Pathfinder, move it up here, unite it. Now we have all of these shapes uh, in place. Then I'll focus on all the detail shapes. These are the shapes on top. And I can select these, select our bottom shape, and I can go back to the Pathfinder and just go minus front. So like a cookie cutter, it's just punching through that bottom shape to create all the detail. But notice when you're working like this, you have to pay attention because notice on the, on the ear, it did that. Well, why did it do that? Because that wasn't even part of the shape. So what I need to do before I do this kind of uh, detailing work, before I punch it, that is, or minus front as illustrators, engineers like to call it, is I'll go in on a shape like this. Once again, this is where you just have to make these, this is where the creative process can get a little weird because um, you just have to pay attention to this stuff. So I'll create a shape like that. Then I'll go ahead and go back to Pathfinder and unite it. That way, when I go to the edit shapes like that, and I select them, select our base art, we all united together, go back to the Pathfinder, minus front, it's gonna retain that curve on the ear, which is what you want, like that. Now, I should point out, that you will run into this at times where Illustrator adds all these extra anchor points because I don't know why. I asked an engineer about this years ago and he says, because Illustrator is too precise. And I just started laughing. I go, oh, whatever, you know. Well, I'm going to show you a plugin. Once again, there isn't Smart Remove on the desktop. It's on the iPad for Illustrator, Illustrator Lite, that is, uh, but not on the desktop. But here's a really another great plugin by Astute Graphics called Smart Remove. And all you have to do is just wipe it over those ones that's not needed. It's smart enough to know what to remove without destroying the curve and geometry of your path. So really cool tool there as well. And obviously the last one is, uh, as these, um, what do you call them, scales. And you can notice my sketch had them going a different way, but as I build, if something looks better handling it differently, I'll always do that. So we'll just select that, select that, minus front. Now we have the final artwork. I can go in, I can start exploring with color in this case to work out the brand mark on this design. The final design was more of a seal. This is how it came out. And that was a lot of fun. So break it up into manageable shapes to build it, makes it easier. And obviously you have a mixing of methods, whether it's using strokes and shapes, you can use all of them together. So if we take a look at a theme, look at reference, once again, doesn't matter if it's graphic or realistic, it's gonna help you, you know, isolate reference. If you struggle with drawing, just think in shapes. Look at this. Deduce it down to simple form and shape and sketch it out. Doesn't have to be perfect. Once you get a sketch, go back in and refine it. Refine those shapes. How exactly will I shape those or build those as I move into Illustrator? And in this case, it's symmetric. So we can create something like this for our final sketch, bring it into Illustrator and start building. Now, when we do that, I notice we have these sketches on. Let's turn it off. You know, we're gonna end up here, we have all of these shapes are just fat to create the outline here. We have interior shapes, these are all strokes. These are just regular fills, no stroke, for the nose and eyes, and then we have the antlers here. If we select these on the on this deer, we're gonna to go to strokes, and we're gonna beef these up because we want these to be thicker. So let's go in here and see what 14 looks like. And oops, I forgot this down here. Let's go ahead and select that as well with these like that. I think it should be a little bigger. Now, I'll be honest, when I work, I work in points and I usually work at whole numbers. Now I'm gonna enter a number that I'd never actually use when I'm building. It's just because of the size I'm showing in Illustrator. Um, 
it, it kind of needs to be this size. So I'm going to punch in this obscure number. And I notice I have a, another layer way down here turned on. I forgot to turn off. Let's turn that off like that. And so this is what I do to create um, these antlers. Then I'd select these like this. And I would clone them, Command-C, Command-F. I go to the Reflect tool, find a central anchor point. Maybe it's on the bridge of his nose. Reflect them over like that. Now it's here where they come to a point. I want them to merge right here. And you might not be aware of this, but if you go to the Scissors tool, this is still useful at times, and you have Smart Guides turned on, Command-U. Hover over, and it'll tell you where those intersect. Click, and it'll cut it like that. So if we go to this one now and select it, find where it intersects like that, cut it. Now we can select these two, just delete them. We don't need it. And we can even select these and we could unite it if you wanted. And then if you go to stroke, right now it's a curve, you could go to points and it's gonna, well, I don't wanna do that because it looks like we have a redundant point in there and sure enough we do. At times, Illustrator will do that. And so that's frustrating because when you change something to a miter that's a corner, it'll do that and you don't want that. And if you expand it, it's, you're gonna have to fix all that. Uh, this is where Illustrator isn't a smart program at times. And this is, once again, I'm sorry to say this, but this is where plugins come in. Notice this highlight down here. This says, hey, you have redundant points here. Click it, it gets rid of that. Now, if I go back here and I click it, it'll fix it. That's why I use plugins. Ultimately on this, we'd expand these into shapes, lock it up with type, and we have our final design. So again, reference is gonna help you. Maybe you're creating a bird. You could look at something like this, do a simple thumbnail sketch like this, and create it with basic shapes. So if we turn on this, you can see we have strokes that make up the leg, strokes that make up these branches, and the main trunk of the branch here all of these, once we have those, we can go path, we can go outlight stroke and turn them into shapes. We can go to Pathfinder and we can unite those. We can take shapes, there are two elliptical shapes, intersect them with Pathfinder to get all the leaves we need. We can go up here, maybe we take uh, the tail and the body shape, we unite that. We take this elliptical shape we have, make sure it's on top, select both, minus front to get this gap in the wing. Well, I just realized I forgot some. I have to make a copy of the body, clone it, select this, intersect it to create the wing. Then we can take this shape, making sure it's on top, select the body, minus front to create that nice gap, select everything, the body, the head, the beak, and unite it together with Pathfinder like this. Bring the eye to the front on top, select this, minus front, select everything, unite together like this. Notice if you go to appearance, in this case, it's a compound. If it's not a compound, I always turn them into compounds. And you can do that by going to object, compound, make. Notice I use F7 keyboard shortcut, saves me time, never have to go to that window. So once we have this, now we can color it however we want. Maybe we're gonna color this one a nice turquoise, get rid of the outline, and that's how quickly. Now, I don't stop here. I usually go in and make micro rounds on the sharp points like his beak and so using the corner widget, but that's how I do it. Ultimately, when it's all said and done, this would work great for an icon for a bird watching app, for example. Let's jump into the fourth category here. And the fourth category is fonts and logo types. This is modifying uh, letter forms. Now, I use the term fonts. The proper term should be typefaces. A font is just technology that a typeface is wrapped in to work on a computer or other software. Uh, so I should point that out. I should have probably uh, labeled this typefaces and logo types uh, because of that. So if that offends some of you, don't worry about it. Uh, let me just walk through a couple examples here. So this is a project I'm still working on right now. They haven't even picked the final design. One of these uh, they're interested in. And you can see how I took a letter form and turned it into a brand mark. But the name of, of this business is First Time Founder. That's what the X stands for. And so all of these derive meaning in terms of what they do and how they support people that they work with. 
But I also take typeface faces like this condensed one at the top, and I go in and add these curves. Like on the Fs, I added the curves. I added the curves on the Es. Those weren't in the typeface, but I did that to kind of soften it, to go with the curve that we have in the mark itself. Uh, this one, I just used the typeface as is. I thought it went and balanced well with the brand mark itself. Didn't change anything about this typeface with this one either. But on the bottom, I did, uh, again, went in and just added these little curves on the F, added a curve on the bottom part of the R, on the T, and the same letter forms, including the E in the word founders. So those how I'll make even little subtle modif modifications on letter forms as I'm working on a logo type like this. That said, a brand mark could be based off of a letter form altogether. So this was for a company I branded called Fennec. And at first I started exploring all these letter forms to represent their brand, represent their company and what they do and tried a lot of different styles. Now, ultimately, ended up going in a different direction that you like better, which is fine. I always explore multiple ways of handling things. But you could, all of these would work great for an app icon if you're working on a company and they're going to need an app icon as well. But usually the way I handle um, editing uh, typefaces. So on this brand mark, I wanted to create typography that could go for it. This was the font I used. I already converted to PaaS since... I can't really give you the font uh, in this file, but it's okay to include the vector art. Now, one thing I want to do is I'm going to zoom in here because notice how I created this shape based off of the angle that I established for this kind of graphic F. And I want to reflect some of that in the typography of this font that I expanded. So I'm just going to move it over like this. I'll take this and I'll just use this to make an edit on this F. So we'll go to the Pathfinder. I'll go minus front like this. This is where I'll select a corner like this. I'll add a nice round to that like this. The E, I'm really not going to mess with the E as much. Usually I'll go in and notice, and I know this might irritate some type of files out there, but I want the X height to be no higher than the capital letter F in this word mark. I exceeds that. So this is where I'll violate some typography designer's rules and I'll just move it down so it has the same X height as you go over. This is where I'll establish a better kerning because not all typefaces are kerned well. The kerning pairs tend to be a little sloppy. There's a lot of emigre fonts that way. Um, Mrs. Eves is a font specifically that comes to mind that has horrible uh, kerning um, pairs in it, and you have to do a lot of work with it to make it look nice. So this is where I'll just figure out the overall spacing like that. I think that looks pretty good. But I noticed on the Y, I didn't like the Y. So I'm just going to snap. This is where Smart Guides, Command U, comes in. I'll just snap to this anchor, snap to this anchor, create a, what I call a throwaway shape, select this Y, minus front, and then I'll take a shape that's the same width here, like that. And then I'll snap that. And even at times, I'll go in, and this is where um, I usually use plugins. Instead of the anchor point tool, I'll use Pathscribe by Astute Graphics, part of the Vectorscribe plugin. And I'll pull over this like that, just so it overlaps. I'll select both of these and I'll go Unite. So I created that, that looks kind of bad. So uh, <laughs> I just wanted enough so I could work with it. So we're gonna play off of this angle of the Y and I'm gonna create another throwaway shape like this. And then I'll figure out where, how far I want this to come over. Let's say it's right about there. I'll select these anchors, drag that over, just so you can see what I'm doing. Let's color this other than black. Ah, that's outlined. Let's do the fill like that. Select the Y, and I'll go ahead and minus front just to play off the same angle in the letter form. And this is how I would lock up this design with typography. Now, 
I'll spend a lot more time finessing spacing and stuff. So what you end up with is something that looks really nice. But one thing I should point out is this visually goes from the top of this into the top of this. The bottom of this goes from the bottom of this F into the bottom of this part. And I pay attention to those associations as well when I work on stuff like this. Let's look at a custom letter form. I wanted this to be square proportion, so I might take these two shapes, this, and I'll go to Pathfinder and I'll minus front like that. Let's go back to layers. I'll turn on strokes. This is where I'll use strokes instead of shapes. I'll select it. And in this case, let's go ahead and just color these differently and go to path, go to uh, outline stroke, turn these into shapes. First thing we're gonna do is unite them so they're all one shape. We'll select that, select the base end we created with basic shapes, and go back to Pathfinder and go minus front. And this just kind of punches everything through. And this is where I would go in with the rounding tool and I wouldn't use the corner widget because you have to select things. And I like using, once again, another plugin called Dynamic Graphics because I can just hover over any corner, establish what I like, that looks good. I'm gonna apply it to this one, I'm gonna apply it to this one, and this one, this one down here like that, and I think that looks a lot better. Now this is at the point, I'll start doing color exploration. So I used freehand for years where you could drag swatches out the swatches palette onto the desktop and lock them together like this well, you can't do that in Illustrator. And I like doing this because you can see the colors bigger and make value judgments. So I'll adjust my colors here, even the largest swatch in the swatches palette view. If I go here, right now we're on the small. If I go to large, it's still not that great because it puts white. So you really can't make color values side by side using that. So I always keep this on a small thumbnail, do this, figure out my colors, apply them, to the shapes, and in this case, this is what this design came out like. So sometimes as you approach logo design, it might be using letter forms as the brand mark. So we created a graphic P for pace. This was based off of the theme of uh, Capricorn. You saw another design we did for the same project, but this one turned Capricorn into a letter R. This one, we turned the, word, the letter W into a dove here for the word, and you saw the graphic uh, shapes that we used to create this target graphic, but this could replace a letter form that has the same size and shape for a letter O. So a lot of things you can do uh, to customize uh, logo types. And starting with the font, it's always good to customize it, then it's unique on its own. So design directions, presenting to clients. How do I do that? Well, I use what I call close to final comps. Here's something for the Grand Mental Health Center, but they have three locations that deal with uh, mental health, addiction recovery, and urgent recovery, but they're all under the same parent company, so they have the same grand name, and it just changes underneath. So I showed each of these on one comp, how each of those locations and the continuity between them can work. I also show it on a dark colored or photographic background. Uh, they're based in Oklahoma, so I took a picture of Oklahoma uh, kind of out in the wilderness and used that just to showcase how it could work in a simple format as well. Here's another one, this for a radio station in Colorado Springs. This is a stack format. This is a more horizontal. They might use this on their website, for example. I usually create secondary brand graphics. I thought this would be a nice seal they could use. Maybe they do buttons at some point. And again, show them how it could work on a dark colored or photographic background as well. Here's a service that you can check out when you have time. It's called yellowimages.com. Uh, great CGI templates that you can buy. Here's a van I bought, uh, reasonably priced, very reasonably priced. They started this site for agencies who needed photo shoot quality mock-ups, but didn't want to spend the money on a photo shoot. And this allows you to get these photorealistic mock-ups. You can show it to your client 
and they can envision how something's going to live in the real world. Here's a logistics company I branded. I use the same yellow images, got a container since they send container ships out, show them how their logo could apply to that. They obviously have trucking with semi trucks. This was a great template uh, to set up to really show them how it could live in the real world and breathe and present itself to the community at large. So you might want to check that out. Once again, yellowimages.com. Uh, brand colors. I want to dive into this because as I'm creating, I'm using raw colors. Notice all these white triangles in the bottom right corner. That means these are global. So I want to talk about raw colors versus global colors. So as I was working on this design, as I originally had it as green. And we can select this and over here in the, the swatches, you see this swatch appear. And if we select this one, this swatch appears. But let's say we want to change this green. So I'm going to, you know, direct select like the part of the word. And you can see this swatch. So I know it's that swatch. So I'm going to double click into it. And let's say we want to make this more of a bluish hue. So we'll go up to 90. We'll bring this one down almost like a, a dusty blue color. And now I click preview. Well, nothing previews, nothing the word changes, nothing in this changes. Well, maybe I click OK. Nope, it won't change anything. That's because this is what is considered a raw CMYK color. If I click into this and click global, this is what you would want to do. But to compare that, let's go to this other green, which is this one. And we're going to go ahead and double click on this. And we're going to click global and all we're going to do is punch in a new color break so we're going to go 75 we'll bump this up to 20 we'll make this bump this up to 80 and we're going to add a little more black 54 and this is kind of a deeper color of green we can preview it and oh it looks <laughs> it looks like we have that color somewhere else let's just add one more to this one and we can click preview and notice our square is changing from what we had to the new color and now if we commit to it and go okay it now has this white triangle that means it's a global color so if i select this and i click the global color now and at some point we decide maybe we want this more purpley i don't know if purpley is is a technical term or not but we'll pretend it is. We'll go like this, add maybe some black to it like that. And you go, what's that going to look like? Well, now notice how it'll globally change wherever that's used. And whether you're doing a logo or a complex diagram or an illustration, it will globally change all the colors. It'll also change tints because global colors, if I select this, which is still based off of this raw color that we changed to blue and i want to create a tint and click on color well you can't but if it's a global color you can click on color and you can change it to a tint of that uh, value so if you want to do tints it has to be a global color so i just want to point that out always get in the habit of working in global colors it'll make your life a lot easier so pantone i recommend the pantone color bridge coded book that's what i use on every branding project if you're if it's only going to be used on uncoded then you could use the equivalent uncoded book but i always use this one it's only when they're printing certain things that i might jump to this to get the equivalent color for that uh, when i set up my brand style guide for clients in this case this radio station this is one of their brands um, these were the cp colors based off of the bridge color book for a color process so these and then the nice thing about in that same book right next to this one will be this one and it shows what the equivalent spot color would be for this process color it also under the spot will show you the rgb break and the hexadecimal number for those colors so i quote when i set up the final assets i provide cmyk spot rgb and if they need to use it for the web, there's a call out that gives them that hexadecimal number that they can use for that. Really great resource. I've been using it for years. It works fabulous for branding. 
also works great for most brand, most iconography is used in the context of branding. So it works for that equally as well. I always set up a style guide. They'll just show them obvious stuff like don't do this. It's amazing how many people screw, screw with vector artwork once they get access to it. But not everything needs to be in full color. Maybe you're working on something and it needs to work in a simple color and you've delivered the color artwork here, but you need something in a simpler format. Well, this is where I'll go into my artwork and I'll just select like this is just a color sitting right on top here. White is sitting on top of this like this. We don't need the white. Now that I have everything, I can select all these, whether it's the mouth, the tongue, the eye, the head with the ears like this, just so you can see what I'm doing. We're gonna color all of these. This magenta, we're gonna to go to Pathfinder, we're gonna to go to Unite. You might have to hit it again. Notice the first Unite create all these extra anchor points. Whenever that happens, try hitting Unite again and it usually resolves it and it'll get rid of those. So now we have all these. We have the outline shape that's the same color as the background. So we're gonna select this that we just united and we're gonna minus front through that. So now all we have is this. Notice when you work with this, it's gonna to revert to a group. You wanna be able to change this to a compound. Once you have it a compound, select the outer line, which is the gray as shown over here. And we're gonna go ahead and minus front out of that. We don't want it gray, we wanna color it white. And this is how I'll create a one color version of a more complex graphic that'll work on a colored dark background or even a photographic background. So I always deliver that. And the last category I wanna get into is creative reality. This is real client stories. And I'm showing you this because I might come across as if you do this, this, you'll never have problems. That's not the case. Here's an example. Here's six projects. All of these started off as great projects. All of these projects have a common denominator of, actually, there's only five projects here. These two were for the, the same project. All of these projects went off the rails for one reason or another. Uh, this client in Nutra Gardens, you saw me build that earlier. Uh, they couldn't make up their mind. They didn't know what they want. That's why that one went off uh, the rails. This one up here was for um, a little town outside in Illinois, and they liked this direction. Everything was going good, and then COVID hit, and they didn't want to do anything. That caused that project to go off the rails, and they just kept what the ugly one they had. Uh, this one, one of my favorite brand marks I've ever created and this client hated everything we did. And I just said, well, that's all I have. And I just had to basically fire the client. This one here, Artijani, this was a, a Giletto company. We we're all done, delivered all the brand assets, all the packaging. He made the mistake of going to his distributor and saying, hey, look at all this great stuff we just created and rebranded with. And his distributor said, I like the old stuff better. And it scared him. So he didn't want to change because he had a contract for $200,000 with that distributor. Uh, that was frustrating. And then this last one, the first craft brewer ever in Oregon uh, that I worked with was this company. I, I changed the name, but I kind of just gave it, away, <laughs> gave it away, but that's okay. I did 21 concepts for them. What they didn't tell me up front is it was a investment committee that was going to make the final choice and their choice was they didn't like any of them and hired an interior designer to do the brand mark and he used clip art and they they could all agree they like that the point i'm bringing up here is you're going to do more designs that never get used than you will will get used i'm a big believer in a systematic process for creating brand identity and iconography for a vast majority of clients, our work has helped them to grow and flourish with their business and marketing, and that's great. So I encourage you to refine your creative process. Will it guarantee a project won't go off the rail at times? No, but that doesn't mean you did anything wrong. So stick with it and continue to improve your skills and cherish those clients who value them. If you like this movie, please consider sharing a link to my YouTube channel on social media. I'd appreciate that. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe as well. 
Thank you for watching People of Process. I hope this content helps you to improve your own creative process.